and now we welcome back Kevin Camps, King of Yucca Mountain. I haven't been deposed yet. <laughs> so, Nothing to say. Oh. <laughs> Rebels. I'm um, talking about Davis Vesey now. And this is the map that, if you don't have a copy, there are some hard copies around the room. So get yourself a hard copy. Uh, this map was put together by our dear friends Irene Koch and Dave Martin back in 1990, Nuclear Awareness Project. But it's uh, entirely relevant, needs an update. There's another project we need to work on. And I will point to it. Davis Messi is, if you don't know, this one right here. And um, yes, it is one of many radioactive bullseyes on the Great Lake Shoreline. That's a security comment, but um, the risk, the radioactive Russian roulette risks as well. So, um, Davis Messi is an old reactor. It began operations in 1977, so it is uh, 34 years old. And this is an engineering curve brought to my attention by David Lockbaum with the Union of Concerned Scientists, their top nuclear safety engineer, who worked for 17 years in the nuclear power industry on boiling water reactors, and has trained NRC inspectors on the proper operation of a boiling water reactor. Uh, the bathtub curve applies to toasters and atomic reactors. And what it indicates is that in the early life of an engineered item, there are bugs in the system that have yet to be worked out, and there is an inexperience among the operating personnel. And this can lead to problems. The risk is higher at a younger age. The risk never goes down to zero, but during middle age, it does decrease as the bugs are worked out, as the operating personnel gain experience. But then you hit a point called the breakdown phase, the wear out failure period, where the systems, structures, and components of the engineered item wear out and begin to fail, despite the experience of the operating personnel. So when you apply this to atomic reactors, you get this kind of graph where Three Mile Island was just months old. Chernobyl was just a year old. Those were uh, break-in phase accidents. And then you've got the ongoing middle age risks. But then you've got uh, the breakdown phase risks. You've got Indian Point, New York, near New York City, which blew a steam generator tube. We've been talking about radioactive steam generator shipments on the Great Lakes. But if you blow a steam generator tube during operations, you face the risk of a cascade of two failures, like falling dominoes. And if you blow enough tubes in succession, you can have a loss of coolant accident in the reactor core. We'll actually talk about a similar accident that Davis Fessy experienced, not because of a tube rupture, but because of a dry out of a steam generator in 1985. But it, it, uh, blocks cooling to the reactor core, and you can, it's a loss of cooling accident. And then another breakdown phase accident was the davis Bessey hole in the head fiasco of 2002, a massive corrosion hole in the lid of the reactor. And in many of these reactors, we are entering the breakdown phase. So here's the NRC website's image of davis Bessey. I've seen others that show Lake Erie, so they try to make these things look as pretty as possible. Here is the 50 mile radius around Davis Vesey. It's called the emergency planning zone, sometimes called the radioactive ingestion pathway zone. It's an arbitrary cutoff point because as we've seen at Chernobyl and even at Fukushima, 50 miles does not indicate that the radioactivity will not exceed that distance if it starts getting out in catastrophic amounts. So you can see that uh, a good part of the metro Detroit area, most of Windsor, uh, the uh, western edge of Cleveland, all of Toledo, all fall within this uh, area. So uh, there is a backgrounder available on one of the back tables, I think that one, uh, where what we did uh, last November, as Davis Bessey applied for its 20-year license extension, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about, we put together a comprehensive background summary of all of the major 
near misses that Davis Bessey has experienced in its first 34 years of operations. The top one, incredibly, was a Three Mile Island precursor incident in 1977, a year and a half before Three Mile Island suffered its 50% meltdown of the reactor core. And by a combination of sheer luck and the experience of one control room operator at Davis Bessey, the uh, incident was um, brought to a screeching halt before it reached the meltdown phase. But it was very close, and unfortunately that word was not spread throughout the nuclear power industry. Despite the efforts of NNRC Regional Inspector out of Chicago, who would not shut up, and that's all described in the uh, background. And then I mentioned in 1985, there was a steam generator dry out incident at Davis Bessey. And in this incident, uh, there was a loss of coolant to the core for 12 minutes. And in this particular accident, it took uh, extraordinary efforts by plant personnel running at top speed throughout the complex with keys that might work, might not work to get through security doors that were locked. And then getting to valves which were chained uh, open or closed in the wrong position. They actually had to cut through the chains on the, the locks on the valves to open up a flow of coolant to the core. And again, they were within a matter of minutes or tens of minutes of a, melt, a meltdown situation in the reactor core. Because uh, in some of these incidents, they went from full power levels to uh, immediate loss of coolant to the core. Another incident at Davis Bessey in 1998, June of 1998, was a direct hit by a tornado. And I'll talk more about that in the next slide. Uh, the 2002 hole in the head, and that's what this image is from. The company, for sure, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission Regional Office had this photograph in their possession long before the public became aware of the little problem at Davis Bessey with a major corrosion hole in the lid. The NRC had filed this away. What it shows is lava, that's what I call it. It's boric acid crystals and rust coming off the lid of the reactor. Clear evidence that there's a major problem going on here, and nobody seemed to understand it. And then we'll talk about the license extension. So this photograph is not from Davis Fessy because I don't know of any photos from the June 1998 direct hit. This is a photo from the Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant in Maryland, and that tornado there is on the Chesapeake Bay. It's only a mile or two away from the nuclear power plant, but it gives some idea of what things may have looked like that June day in 1998 with Davis Fessy. I actually got caught in that tornado. I was in Ann Arbor, and the first sign of trouble was the sky turned kind of a greenish orange all at the same time, and then the hail started to fall, and I thought the windshield was going to crack from the intensity. So what happened was, uh, there are no windows in the control room at Davis Bessie. They also did not have a radio turned on. And so as this tornado approached the plant, they had no warning. Nobody thought to call them. So the first sign of trouble was the guard shack at the front entrance calling the control room because a funnel cloud had just passed by. And they had you know, sheer seconds to shut the reactor, to scram it, SRAM stands for Safety Control Rod Axeman, by the way. The Fermi reactor in Chicago, 1942, during the Manhattan Project, they actually had a guy with an axe standing next to a rope to chop it if there was trouble to drop a control rod into the reactor to save Chicago, which was a few miles to the north. Not even that. Downtown Chicago. Safety Control Rod Axeman. So they scrammed the Davis Bessey reactor in a great big hurry, luckily, with that few seconds warning they had. And, but like Fukushima, they still had days of cooling of the core and days of cooling the pool ahead of them. And uh, what happened was the primary grid got knocked out by the tornado, completely destroyed. They were thrown onto their emergency diesel generators. They had two. The first one would not start. It was a complete loss. They gave up on it right away. The second one kept breaking down. And again, David Lockbaum and Union of Concerned Scientists described it again as extraordinary efforts by plant personnel to continue to repair the second emergency diesel generator. Because as soon as it would stop, the core, which had been at full power 
for the tornado struck would begin immediately to heat up. You've only got hours, perhaps, before that core could actually begin to melt down. The pool will take a day or two to boil dry, but again, it would, uh, incredibly, I just recently learned that there is no backup power on the pools in the United States. There's no emergency diesel generators, there's no batteries. Another difference between the U.S. and Canada is 90% of the batteries that serve as emergency backup on reactor cores in the U.S. have a four-hour lifespan. In Japan, it was eight hours. So uh, just as the second diesel generator died on day two of this accident, the grid was restored. And so they were able to bring things under control at Davis Messi, again by sheer luck. Now this is a graphic showing how deep the corrosion was in 2002, the hole in the head fiasco, and uh, nearly seven inches of carbon steel on the reactor lid were eaten through because these insertion points that you can see for the control rods were leaking boric acid from inside the reactor. And the boric acid is in there to help control the nuclear reaction to absorb neutrons. But inside the reactor, you can see the thin lining on the interior that's stainless steel. It's 3 sixteenths of an inch in diameter. And uh, through those insertion points, boric acid was leaking onto the carbon steel, which is susceptible to corrosion. And so how, how long this had been going on, I'm not aware of. But they had nearly eaten completely through the lid. All that was left was the steel liner, which was bulging and soon to burst. That's how close it came to a major accident a loss of coolant in the reactor core. Containment would have been the last line of defense. Other issues at Davis Bessie include uh, the growing stockpile of high-level radioactive waste. This is what it looks like. It's one of these more rare uh, horizontal orientations. And I've got the figure for how much waste is at Davis Bessie. Ballpark, um, 525 metric tons of high-level radioactive waste in a filled to capacity pool and the overflow parking in this outdoor dry cast storage that by the mid-90s we knew had been manufactured in a bad way. The, uh, the grinding on the interior steel canisters was done uh, improperly, and they're too thin-walled, actually. So the license extension, they applied uh, last summer. The NRC let us know about it in October. They gave us two months to intervene. Our deadline was over Christmas. We managed four groups, Young Nuclear, Citizens Environmental Alliance of Southwestern Ontario, Don't Waste Michigan, and the Green Party of Ohio. We managed to get a petition and request for hearing and intervention turned in on time by a small miracle. Our contentions were that wind power could replace Davis Bessie, that solar power in the form of photovoltaics could do it as well, that a combination of the two could certainly do it. The reason we had to do that is they require a discrete source of electricity. And if we simply went ahead with a wind plus solar power, they could have thrown us out on a technicality. But we wanted to get the point in anyway. And then the final contention was severe accident mitigation alternatives. So wind, the first wind-generated electricity on planet Earth took place in Cleveland, Ohio in the year 1888. The inventor was named Charles Brush. This is his wind turbine. 60 feet tall, 60 feet in diameter, and it powered his home. 12 kilowatts, but it was 130 years ago. It's possible. This is in Cleveland. Well, we have a modern day inventor by the name of Al Compan, an emeritus professor of physics at the University of Toledo, who's joined our intervention team. He's an inventor of solar PV materials. And he wrote our contention on solar PV as an alternative to Davis Bessey. And he showed that by putting solar PV panels on the Davis Bessey site, 250 acres, another site owned by First Energy Nuclear, which is called the Norton Compressed Air Energy Storage Facility, about 50 acres, and then the commercial rooftops in urban northern Ohio in just four or five cities, you could displace, replace Davis Bessey's 908 megawatts electric with solar PV in Northern Ohio. Mm -hmm. Solar PV alone. Mm -hmm. 
Now, severe accident mitigation alternatives, it's a techno phrase. It means first energy spending a little bit of money now to put some systems in that would prevent major accidents and catastrophic radioactivity releases. Davis Bessie did 170 different scenarios of accidents and found all of them to not be cost beneficial to put in improvements. So they're not going to. They have no improvements in mind at Davis Bessie. That's now 35 years old. They want to go 20 years beyond their 40 year license. And by the way, their license expires in 2017. So they want to go until 2037. Mm -hmm. So these are some real life severe accidents. Three Mile Island on the left, um, Chernobyl on the right. Here's Fukushima again. You might want to prevent those things from happening if you can. So here's the update. Um, the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, which is a three administrative law judge panel from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, on Chernobyl's 25th anniversary, ironically, uh, granted us standing and accepted um, portions of our contentions, which means we're in, there will be a hearing. Um, somewhat good news, Terry Lodge, our pro bono attorney out of Toledo, calls it a split decision because the company and the NRC staff, which is against us, by the way, protectors of public health and safety in the environment are opposing our intervention. Uh, they also got a lot of our stuff thrown out. So on May 6th, First Energy appealed to the NRC commissioners, the five commissioners, trying to overturn this licensing board ruling. And uh, the next thing coming up is on May 19th, a telephone conference call with the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, but open to members of the public and the media, as well as parties to this proceeding. And what you would need to do is call this staff person at the licensing board, Hillary Kane, at that phone number, let her know you want to be on the call. And uh, here's the inside information she will give you at the time, which is the call-in number and the passcode. And you won't be able to speak as members of the public, but you can hear what's going on. And most importantly, you'll be sending a message to the licensing board that they're actually being watched, and they better watch what they do. And then at some point, we will have hearings and try to block this 20-year uh, license extension. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Can you tell how to let people know how they fix Davis Bessie? I thought that was interesting. Well, the original proposal that we put a halt to immediately was they proposed a patch on the hole. They were just going to patch the hole. And Citizens Action Coalition of Indiana showed up with a banner-sized band-aid and bumper sticker band-aids. And uh, that didn't fly. But what they ended up doing was under armed guard by the Michigan State Police and then the Ohio State Police on a semi-truck, they hauled down one of the lids from the Midland Nuclear Power Plant which was constructed but never fired up, thanks to the efforts of the folks in this room and Mary Sinclair. And they put that old lid on, the, uh, that, that brand new old lid on the Davis Bessie reactor. But it didn't fit exactly right, so they had to retrofit it a bit. And lo and behold, by spring of 2010, and so it had only been in operation for, what, six years, I guess, it already had sprung leaks. And David Lockbaum, who's been a long time watchdog on Davis Bessie, pointed out to the NRC that post uh, 2002, they were supposed to immediately shut down Davis Bessie if they had any good leaks. And the NRC has not required them to shut down. So they actually have ordered a third lid for Davis Bessie. And this is a problem with pressurized water reactors, these uh, lid corrosion problems. And Palisades over in southwest Michigan has a severely corroded lid that was supposed to be replaced by July 2007, according to previous owner Consumers Energy. Well, current owner Energy Nuclear thinks the lid's just fine, and so does the NRC, which has for probably the sixth time weakened its uh, regulations at Palisades on the embrittlement of the reactor pressure vessel, but they've also backed off on requiring that that lid be replaced at Palisades. So, no lessons learned apparently at Davis Messi. How do uh, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the utilities uh, rationalize <coughs> 20 year licensing and suspensions? Uh, we have your bathtub curve, zero on display. Well, in fact, uh, Some in the nuclear industry even want to see reactors uh, licenses 
80 is the new 60. Um, it's hard to uh, figure it out. Uh, the risks are uh, very high, and there are some concerted efforts to block license extensions in this country. Vermont Yankee, at the top of that list, the state of Vermont is adamantly opposed to that Fukushima design getting another 20 years. And that is very much coming to a head. The NRC commissioners voted five to zero to extend the Vermont Yankee license by 20 years on March 10th, the day before Fukushima began. So the state of Vermont is very determined to prevent that from happening. The governor of Vermont was the state senator, state senator who led the effort a year ago, and by a 26 to four vote in the Vermont State Senate, they voted no, you will not get a 20 year license extension. And someone else had asked uh, how could other states like Michigan do a similar thing to Victor. Um, well, the state of Vermont gave itself that right about five years ago. They said it would take the governor, the Senate, and the House at the state level all agreeing that a 20 year license extension was acceptable. And the state Senate put an end to that real quick 26 to 4 vote. And the NRC has disregarded that. So it's turning into a federal versus state issue. And it could well, it's already in the courts. Entergy Nuclear, which owns Palisades as well, has sued the state of Vermont over this block that the state has put on it. So a lot of states, unfortunately not here, are awake to the risks of these old reactors. New York State at Indian Point, also owned by Entergy. The state of Massachusetts at Pilgrim, also owned by Entergy. Entergy's reputation is buy them cheap and run them into the ground. And last question in the back. Was there a question in the back? Okay, last question. Could we put the uh, telephone numbers up? Yes, we ordered that. You got it? Great. So thank you, Kevin Katz. Thank you. Uh,